Good morning. <coughs> Can I welcome everyone to the 23rd meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2017. Uh, can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting. This is the second meeting where we'll be considering the Children and Young People Information Sharing Scotland Bill. Two weeks ago we heard from Scottish Government officials and this morning we have two panels. Firstly, from representatives of the legal profession and secondly, from members of the health service. So can I welcome to the meeting Kenny Meakin, who's a member of the Privacy Lobs Law Subcommittee at the Law Society of Scotland, and Janice Scott, QC from the Faculty of Advocates. I'd like to start off this morning by asking Liz Smith to ask um, a question. Thank you, convener. I, I wonder if I could uh, ask the uh, representative from the Faculty of Advocates, uh, Janice Scott, the first question. Um, in your submission, um, you rightly say that the Supreme Court obviously identified two key issues. The first was that there was a serious lack of uh, clarity for those implementing the legislation, and the second was the lack of safeguards for those affected. And you say that neither of these issues is easy to resolve, and that some criticisms from the Supreme Court will continue to apply if the bill as drafted is passed and the accompanying code of practice is approved. Could you be very specific about you, wh what you think these criticisms from the Supreme Court are and why they won't be addressed? Well, if I can start by looking at what the criticism actually was, because you've solved one problem to raise another in this particular case. And what the Supreme Court said was that um, when you required in the last legislation the sharing of data, but at the same time required compliance with the Data Protection Act, what you were doing was imposing a circular consideration on health visitors, teachers, and others who were required to fulfil this legislation. Because um, if you were required to do something by law, you weren't in breach of the Data Protection Act. But the Data Protection Act itself gave you exemption only if you were required to do something by law. <laughs> and so you had a circular problem. So what you've done is you, in this bill, what you're proposing to do is to shift the argument so there is no longer a requirement to share information, there is a power to share legislation. So you've removed the difficulty of circularity, but in doing so, if you look at what the Supreme Court said, um, requirement to share then gave you protection under Section 35 of the Data Protection Act. And because you're no longer required to share, you remove that protection. So you've shifted the responsibility for um, safeguarding people's data effectively onto the data processor, the information holder. So you're requiring um, health visitors, you're requiring teachers, requiring lay people to implement very complex law on data protection. And it's very fast moving law. And if you look at the responses which you've got to um, your consultation exercise, you'll see that they're puzzled. They don't know what to do. They're saying, would you please define terms for us? And um, it's going to be difficult for them. And I can go on to, to what the, the problem is with defining terms, if you'd like me to do so. I'll just come to that in, in a minute, if I may. Yeah. And just to be very clear, are you saying that the responsibility uh, for taking the decision has effectively been shifted onto the named person, onto the practitioner, instead of resting in law or w with Parliament uh, having scrutinised that law? Is that, is that what you consider to be the problem? Well, that is, part, that is part of the problem, yes. And it's not just the named person. It's the service provider in other respects who has to consider whether to pass on data to the named person. So you're asking lay people who are involved in the care of children in other respects to um, exercise some very complex functions. And the issue that is raised by the Supreme Court is, is this clear enough to allow them to know what they're doing and clear enough to allow families uh, to, know, to, to foresee what is going to happen when they share data with their dentist, their doctor, their health visitor, their teacher? Do they know what's going to happen? And can they regulate their behavior if they feel they need to regulate the behavior accordingly? Thank you, that's very helpful. Uh, can I come to the uh, substantive issue, which I believe has been a, uh, quite a problem since the Children and Young People's uh, Act was passed? And obviously it's a very considerable issue at the present time, and that's this uh, definition or lack of definition of the term well-being. And that's been raised in quite a number of the submissions. I'd be interested in the Law Society's perspective on this as well. Um, we were uh, given the information from the uh, bill team uh, two weeks ago uh, 
um, who were saying that uh, the term uh, well-being has been well utilised and understood by practitioners, by families and by children. Do you share that view? No. <laughs> Uh, it, 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 the Supreme Court um, said that this is a very vague um, con con consideration. It, it's not well-being in the general sense when you use it in a piece of legislation where there's a statute definition. You've got your statute definition later in the legislation, and it's based on your Shinari concepts. And um, it, it's a very low threshold um, for legal intervention, if you like. Um, and... I would not say it can be easily understood, but that's my impression as a lawyer. If practitioners have a different view, so be it. Um, from a data protection perspective, um, it's a much lower threshold than is um, appropriate for the processing of people's data. And I think Kenny would be better place to speak to that as he's involved in local authority work on that. Could I just ask, I mean, this, this well-being concept is absolutely crucial and, uh, you know, very clear in the, in the judgment, um, in, in paragraph 16 in the judgment, you know, well-being is not defined. And it makes the point that the Shinari indices that have been used are far too vague. Um, you know, they can be misinterpreted or they can be interpreted in different ways. And that is a fundamental issue about uh, a, a, a practitioner having to decide when, and in this case, when to make the decision about whether they should share the information. So is it, is it correct in your mind that this fundamental problem of a lack of definition of well-being remains a central problem in this new uh, section of the bill? Yes, indeed. But what you have to bear in mind is that the test for sharing data is higher than that. And so your practitioners are looking at well-being on the one hand and saying, am I required to consider whether to pass, in my opinion, I need to pass on data. And on the other, can I? And the test for can I is higher than the test of should I be considering it? So you're, you're asking them to do quite a difficult juggling act. And that's part of the problem with the um, accessibility of the legislation to ordinary practitioners and families. Would it be all right, Convener, to have the Law Society's perspective? Okay. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, matter was considered by the Law Society's Family Law Committee as well. Um, they elected to send me here, conscious that Janice um, was well able to speak to family law aspect. They did have concerns about the oversharing of information under the previous non-statutory regime. Um, GERFIC was working and it was applied reasonably coherently. Um, but whether or not the level of understanding sufficient to make something work on the ground is giving you sufficient clarity to allow you to frame legislation around it is a slightly different question. Because if the, the well-being threshold is much lower than what we'd have done in terms of child protection measures, you know, the child protection threshold is well understood. If you have a concern about the child protection issues, then nobody is ever going to turn around and say, don't share the information. That's a message we've really been trying to push through. It comes through in Caldecott 2, for example, which talks about the duty to share information in certain contexts. Because the well-being threshold is lower, it does give you a commensurately higher hurdle to pass if you're going to make sure that the sharing is proportionate. And just my, my final point on, on this would be that, obviously, the, as I understand it, the Scottish Government's illustrative code is designed uh, to deal with this uh, issue of safeguarding and to help the practitioner to understand what that safeguarding uh, rule is. But if the term well-being is not adequately defined, am I right in saying that that remains a central problem for taking this legislation and, indeed, the code any further? I would say so. Um, you need to be clear as to the purpose for which you're sharing the information. If the underlying purpose of well-being isn't clear, then how can you say why you're sharing the information? Right away, you fundamentally fall full of the clarity requirements under Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm just about to let Claire Hockey in, but has well-being, the definition of well-being, is, is well-being not already well used? In, in Scottish terms? It is well used by practitioners in the field, um, but that is a, it's probably a muddling of through approach. They share information, which would uh, on some occasions be based around the, their concerns about well-being? The, yeah, the GERFIC approach has been proceeding on a non-statutory basis reasonably successfully, um, but probably with... There will be some information sharing so, that, so what, of a what, lower level, I think. What we've got just now or what has been proposed just now is already in place? It's codifying an existing practice. 
okay. or what was an existing practice. I think practice has tailed off somewhat in the wake of the Supreme Court decision. Okay, right, thank you. Now, and uh, thank you, panel, for coming in this morning. And I'd like to refer uh, members to my register of interest because I'm going to ask specifically some questions around about healthcare. Um, in your submission on the complexity of uh, the legal framework, both Faculty of Advocates and the Law Society refer to the difficulty that busy professionals will have in making decisions about information sharing. However, the RCN, in their uh, submission, uh, and I'm quoting for the, from their submission, healthcare professionals such as health visitors are already well practised and familiar with information sharing and how to do this in line with data protection law, European law, and in a manner that is compatible with the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, would you care to comment on their submission? Would you contradict that? I don't disagree that medical professionals are well versed in safeguarding. Professionals, not medical professionals. Healthcare oh, professionals, healthcare. more generally. Sorry, um, healthcare professionals. Yes, it's well understood that they have obligations of confidentiality in relation to the information regarding the patients that they're seeing. We're rolling this out to a group who are much less familiar with the kind of concept of multi-agency working that this would involve. You know, primary head teachers, other than being occasionally involved in child protection conference, will not have a native background in dealing with a complex multi-agency referral of the type that this would envisage. Um, secondary head teachers and but guidance teachers. Meeting, with due respect, I'm actually asking you about healthcare professionals. Okay. The healthcare professionals, I'm reasonably satisfied, have a working understanding of safeguarding information. Where you're asking them to do something different as well is to almost turn that on its head and say, notwithstanding your understanding of patient confidentiality, we're now saying you need to share this information more widely than you have previously. You see that currently there, and, and I found it a rather condescending comment, I have to say, muddling through. It was not intended to be condescending. It was intended to say that they're operating a non-codified <coughs> set of rules. The other thing, of course, is that health professionals are, by, the, by definition, dealing with sensitive personal information, which has a much more restricted approach in terms of sharing. And um, this legislation deals with information that isn't falling within what was in the Data Protection Act as sensitive personal data. Um, so we're looking at broadening this. And one of the issues is, have we adequately categorised information between the, the general data for sharing and the more sensitive data for sharing? So it, it may be that the nurses, and if they say they're comfortable with this, so be it. I haven't seen any cases about challenging nurses sharing and whether they're sharing appropriately or not, so I can't comment on that. But one of the concerns is the broadening of the scope of sharing that's implicit in what you are proposing to put in place, if indeed this legislation is necessary at all. And so, so what would you be saying the level of uh, legal expertise framework would need to be what, to satisfy yourself? <laughs> well, how long is a piece of string? It's difficult. I mean, what, one of the, the issues is that what we have at the moment clearly hasn't done it. I, I think the committee would be bound to acknowledge that the existing um, attempt at preparing a code is, is not adequate to give helpful advice to those who need to deal with this. It would be okay for a lawyer um, who could then look at the matter, but... Um, Sorry, the code, yes. Cool. Well, the, the problem with the bill is it can only operate in conjunction with the code. If the code is satisfactory, um, then that assists in dealing with some of the issues in relation to the bill. But the code's in draft at the moment? The code is in draft at the moment, yeah. yes. So it's not, a it's not the final piece of work? No, but uh, it's a question really whether the committee is prepared to sanction a piece of legislation which is dependent upon a code which is not satisfactorily drafted, which is going to be extraordinarily difficult to draft. Cabinet Secretary here on the 8th of November, and we have other sessions between now and then, so I'm kind of hoping that by that time we'll have a much clearer picture about what it will be. Well, yes, but the trouble with respect, is that this is a very rapidly moving area. You're hitting a moving target. <laughs> I'm trying not to hit them at all, but the, <laughs> the, one of the things that, that, that seems to be here is, A, it's not just health professionals, it's, there's, there's a wider range than that, but is it not then more about a training issue? A lot of the things that, that you seem to say, Mr. Meekin, is that, that uh, there's 
a, a wide scope of, of things that they have to know now that they didn't know before, but is that not just about making them aware of, of the parameters that they're working in? I spend a significant amount of my working life actually training people in data protection issues, and it's not an easy subject for people to embrace. We, a lot of what we've done has been around the getting the message across of keep people's data safe and secure. So, barring human error, we're usually not too bad at that. What we're now saying is you now have to engage in a much more deeper understanding of data protection human rights legislation in order to actually satisfy yourself that all these tests have been met. And the tests in the Code of Practice are, in some regards, misleading at best. And the Code of Practice suggests that ask for consent. If you don't get consent, think if you can share it anyway. That runs very much counter to the ICO's Code of Practice on Data Sharing, which makes it quite clear. If you're going to share without consent, don't ask for consent because that's misleading people. So you've got concepts like that that you're going to have to train people up in terms of, and I think the Code of Practice doesn't really address that. The Code of Practice reads as a primer on information law, um, and I have actually commended it to a couple of colleagues who were interested in finding out more about it, but it's not really going to tell a professional from a different discipline what they need to know. It doesn't really tie it back to any way, in any meaningful way to the exercise of what a named person is supposed to do. So you're suggesting that the problem here that then lies around how the Code of Practice is written and that it should be made clearer? The Code of Practice has to be made clearer. There are some problems in relation to the legislation itself. Um, in, in large measure, the legislation, when you actually strip it back, what this bill is doing is providing a statutory vehicle for the Code of Practice. You know, the, the powers to share information arguably already exist. You know, we've been sharing information because it's reasonably necessary for us to carry out our other functions in terms of being the education authority or being the health authority. And it's reasonably necessary for us to share information in order to carry out those functions. That's a reasonably well-established legal test. So adding in the specific powers in this bill, in some respects, doesn't add anything to what we already have. What the bill does is create the statutory code of practice. That ultimately is the real meat of this bill. Uh, uh, Jolene, do you want to come in? Yeah. Um, just one thing I want to pick up on. It's a draft code of practice. Is that not correct? It is a draft code of yeah. practice. I've spoken to the bill team myself about it, who did yeah. indicate that... I, I would prefer that we actually refer to it as a draft code of practice, because I think the impression that's given anybody watching this is that the code of practice is set in stone, and obviously it's a, it's a, it's a draft at the moment. Um, I want to pick up on something that you said earlier in response to Claire Hockey, where you said that head teachers and guidance teachers are not used to data, share, uh, data sharing practices and child protection issues. That's not really the case, though, is it? They are less used to it. Um, they, are, they are involved at the moment in terms of child protection processes, but that's a much higher hurdle and it's easier to understand exactly why you're sharing the information because you have an issue which says this child is or may be at risk of harm. And everyone can understand that. That's, a, that's something people can understand and we're sharing the information in order to protect that child. Teachers are involved in children's hearings issues with child protection every single day of their working life. So I, I'm, I'm concerned that that kind of, of language being used, any te uh, guidance teachers or head teachers watching that will be, will not be very pleased that you're saying that they're, not, they're less used to sh data sharing than other, other sectors, and it's not the case. I, I do work regularly with these people, um, and I'm in no way, shape or form under, under stating how skilled and experienced they are in that area. This is asking them to get involved in a new area with softer data and with a less obvious reason as to why they're being asked to do it. Okay, sorry. Daniel, then Joanne, then Tavis. Just a, a, a quick question <coughs> about the Code of Practice. My understanding is that the Supreme Court uh, ruling suggested that there should be statutory guidance subject to secondary legislation. I mean, my understanding is that the, 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 this illustrative code is, is, is short of that. Um, and do you think that is a, a, a flaw in the, the, the current approach? The, the Law Society submission um, deliberately didn't go into a lot of detail on the draft code of practice for the simple reason that it is a draft code of practice. I think the faculty have expressed some misgivings which we would share. Um, and I've seen the ICO's written evidence that I think you'll be discussing at a future session, which goes into some detail as to why they don't believe the current draft code of practice is adequate. Um, I would broadly say that we agree with those submissions, but I also understand from the Cabinet Secretary's previous attendance here that the intention is to redo 
the draft code of practice to reflect GDPR requirements. And since we now actually have the UK Data Protection Bill as of the end of last week, um, perhaps take that into account as much as we can, given that it's only starting its parliamentary journey. I think the problem is that um, the, the meat of what you're proposing to do will be in the final code of practice, and that is something which will not be before Parliament. Um, and that's a, a big issue, isn't it? That you're, Would you want to approve something for these professionals to implement that you haven't seen and which can be changed? So just to clarify, you're saying that it would be better if this guidance was put on a statutory footing? Well, it would be better if it was on a footing that allowed parliamentary MSPs scrutiny. parliamentary scrutiny of it. Perfect. That's exactly what I wanted to yeah. know. Okay, hey, Joan. Um, <coughs> thank you very much. I suppose a, a couple of just lay people, lay person questions. Um, although I was involved in this area of work myself while I was still a teacher. Um, the first thing is you talk about um, the challenges. It's, my understanding is a two-step challenge for somebody. They have to decide whether the information they're going to share falls within this legal area, and then they have to show so they've got a duty to consider what evidence would they need to be able to provide in order to fulfil that duty to show that they had considered and what and then decided not to share or to share. What would what would be their responsibility in terms of actually first of all deciding does it fit within this do I have to think about this at all? And then once to do, what evidence do I have to show that I've thought about it? That's a practice issue, yes, isn't it? Yes, that, that, that is a practice issue. Um, you know, at its most extreme, you could end up doing a full-blown privacy impact assessment or data protection impact assessment, but that would be far too cumbersome to do on any kind of day-to-day -day basis. So I would imagine you would end up, in practical terms, coming down to some form of pro forma that says, we've considered these factors which are in favour of sharing. We've considered these factors which would suggest maybe we shouldn't. We've taken into account the views of the young person, the parent, if that is applicable in the circumstances. And on balance of all of these factors, we've decided to share the information. Mm -hmm. But if they decide not to share the information, further down the line, something happens, would that decision then be scrutinised legally? Or is it just that you've done it, it's OK? Or does the quality of the decision making come into play at all? Quality of decision making can always be challenged, ultimately by way of judicial review. Um, I wouldn't be proposing that we would ask all the named persons out there to draft a judicial review bomb-proof decision notice of every decision that they make. That's just not going to be workable. Mm -hmm. um, yes, if the decision is wrong, it can be challenged and scrutinised down the line. I wouldn't disagree with that, and I think that's absolutely correct that it should be. But I wouldn't want to create a vast cottage industry of documentation surrounding this. Okay, and. Uh to, um, find, and again, I'm probably showing my ignorance here, is what happens where there's a conflict of interest in sharing of the information? I might take the view it's in the interest of the child for me to share this information, but certainly not in the interest of the parent to have that information shared. Um, How is that resolved? That's, the legislation is to support the well-being of the child. The interest of the child would have to take paramountcy here, unless there was such a mismatch in the relevant interests, if there was a very small benefit to the child versus a huge disbenefit to the parent, then that would be taken into account as part of your proportionality arguments in the balancing exercise you would do under Article 8 DCHR. Yeah. And the last point, I think in the last session we were told that the code of practice was illustrative, not draft, but illustrative. You wonder, is there a distinction between these two things? <laughs> That's a political term, isn't it? I think one of the things that might be helpful is to think that whether you're passing a piece of legislation that is going to be compliant with all the requirements that you need, and then secondly, whether it is going to be implemented in a lawful manner. And one of the, the problems is the meeting of these is the Supreme Court was concerned that because it was unclear, it couldn't be easily implemented in a manner that was lawfully compliant. And what we're drilling down to in, in your questions is how, how easy, how um, appropriate is going to be the implementation of this legislation. And you're expressing concerns in your questions as to how it's actually going to be done and what are the practical parts. And that's the part where um, the professionals need the guidance. At the moment, we're looking at a higher level at whether it's actually going to be 
um, a framework which is going to meet the requirements of the law because that was the concern of the Supreme Court. It's also whether the, um, the, the practice inhibits the policy intention which was to, to safeguard children. And I, I don't, I mean, this may not, the, the practicalities of this legislation, one of our judgments, I think, will be to test that against the intention of the original legislation. But thank you. Okay, thank you, Tavish. Thank you, and my apologies for being late. Um, in the Faculty of Advocates' um, uh, submission to this committee, it states the, its imposition, which I mean, I presume to mean the draft code, um, risks making their, that's professional people's, job considerably more difficult and undermining the trust of families and the willingness to share information with the professionals concerned. Could you just expand on your argument there, please? Well, if um, families don't know what professional people, what teachers and health visitors and midwives and so on are going to do with the information that's shared with them, will they be willing to come? It's, it's outlined in the Supreme Court's um, decision. So uh, am I willing to share with my health visitor that I have postnatal depression? Because where will that information go? Can I be certain that that information will not be shared with my child's teacher? Uh, or when will it be shared with my child's teacher? Would it be passed on to my child's teacher without my consent? And in those circumstances, will I be actually willing to tell my health visitor I've got postnatal depression? And if I don't, where will my depression take me? That, that's just a sort of small example of the sort of issues mm -hmm. that may arise unless we have clarity for families and their kept involved in, in the process. The, the, the difficulty at the moment is the draft code doesn't really help very much. It's a legal document. Mm. It, it outlines the law, um, but it doesn't give you a clear pointer as to where those sort of issues are going to be taken. Kenny, is that the sort of thing that you were thinking of? Yes. Um, broadly speaking, yes. Um, the, the illustrative code of practice, I don't think, provides any meaningful guidance in its current form. Um, I, I do understand that it will be getting rewritten, so I wasn't proposing to speak about it at great length. But what I think, more fundamentally in terms of the shape of the legislation, is trying to reconcile two almost irreconcilable points. One is that you have the Supreme Court saying this is all about sharing information without consent. So then you build a consent model into this legislation, but then you look at the GDPR, which is on the horizon, and the draft guidance that's been issued in terms of consent under GDPR, and that makes the point that because consent under GDPR has to be freely given and informed, then it's not going to work terribly well if you have a situation where there's a massive imbalance in power between the agency in question that's asking for consent and the person being asked. And specifically, it says that if you are a public authority, consent is possibly not going to be the most appropriate way forward because of that very power imbalance. And I think that's a really, really difficult square to circle. You know, we need to have a consent-based model, but we will have difficulty making a consent-based model fit within the requirements of GDPR. I'm not saying it's impossible, I'm saying it is a very, very difficult balancing act that this Parliament faces to try and get to that. And you mean that as to how that will affect professionals conducting their duties? Yes, indeed. Because of the point you made earlier on about the contradiction between one, as it were, culture of... of a clarity that they're uh, about someone's privacy as opposed to the opposite taking place here? Yes. I may be misconstruing that, but that's what I no, took that's, earlier remarks. It is, it's asking people to change their mindset somewhat, yeah. but we're asking them to do it at a time where, as we say, this is not a good time to be trying to legislate in this particular field because we're on very much a moving target in terms of what the UK data protection legislation is going to look like. You know, we have the GDPR, but an awful lot of GDPR requires member states of the EU to actually make its own derogations and exemptions and we've only just had visibility of what the UK government's thinking on that is as of Friday of last week. So right. it's so very hard to actually see how we can get this to tie into that new legislative framework. Totally get that point. And does that explain why the illustrative draft code is so weak? As you have made it, to, but all the submissions as well, many of the submissions the committee received have, have been not kind on the, on the draft code of practice because of the point you made, it's a legal document, but how is a practitioner meant to understand that? Is, is that partly explained by your point about the timing of these changes? Yeah, the timing hasn't changed. The, the timing of it hasn't helped. That's yeah. certainly true. Um, I believe the bill team deliberately couched it in terms of the current law so that it would give this committee a flavour for what they were thinking of rather than that's what it was going to look like in its final form because they're well aware that the Data Protection Act 98 won't be the law in force by the time this legislation is implemented. Yeah. But both of you have suggested today that it is very difficult for Parliament to pass a bill 
which gives effect to a court when the court is so deficient as it currently is drafted? The other problem is it's going to be difficult to draft. I mean, if you just take three points, um, we've discussed well-being and the vagueness of well-being and the centrality of that to whatever you're doing under this code and the legislation. Secondly, you've got words which you can pick out from some of the submissions, things like sensitivity, which is not the same thing as sensitive personal data, which relates to a categorised um, form of data. So are we misusing words? And the third is there are some undefined concepts like vital interests. Some submissions have built up. Well, we're just not going to be able to help them on that. They'll have to form a judgment on it and we'll have to help them give a judgment. But it's requiring a very difficult judgment to be made. And I accept that, that the Royal College of Nursing is, is content with its position, but various other organisations are not content mm. with their position mm. on that mm. and are confused and worried by it. Is, is the danger of presumably passing a, a, a bill w w with all the d deficiencies of the code and so on and so forth is that given that we've got organisations who are absolutely against this from first principles, there'll be a legal challenge again, won't there? This is setting up a near certain legal challenge again, isn't it? Either to the bill, or the, the structure of the legislation, if not to the structure of the legislation, to individual instances yeah. of data processing. Yeah, yes, so, we do, so Parliament achieves nothing. We pass a bill that then gets legally challenged, and the people we're meant to be helping, children and young people, are bypassed by a process that goes back into court and, and we spend another two or years. Or challenged past it. and find yeah. themselves at the sharp end of a litigation when they're actually wanting to help children and trying to do their best to implement a piece of legislation yeah. we've passed. That's very helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, it's very helpful. But I suspect the government already know that any bill that comes through is likely to be <laughs> a legally challenged, so let's hope that. They've got it tightened by the time we get to that stage. Uh, Oliver, then Daniel, then Colin. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. I want to ask some questions about the Code of Practice. Uh, you say in the Faculty of Advocates submission that it's not a substitute for legislation. And you've obviously made reference to the fact it wouldn't be debated or passed uh, by Parliament. I therefore wondered if you believe the proposed bill gets the balance wrong and whether more of the guiding principles and possibly the need for a legal test for consent should be on the face of the bill? The difficulty is whether you can legislate for something that's already in other legislation, and we know that the existing legislation won't be in place very soon. In fact, 25th of May it'll go out because the regulation will be directly enforceable. So anything you do has to be compatible with that. Our proposal was that um, the Supreme Court had made such an issue of informing people that their data was being shared, that uh, we wanted to add that to the essential considerations that were required of the person holding the service provider. So um, we were saying that uh, if you're going to ask the service provider to consider whether they should share the information in terms of the wellbeing test and then giving them power to do so, uh, one should add to that the consideration specified by the Supreme Court of whether it was appropriate to inform and so on. I mean, you, you'll see the proposal we made. and We thought that was consistent with the, the bill and I don't think it was necessarily something that the Cabinet Secretary would... would be opposed to. It's not imposing an extra test uh, other than one that's within the intendment of the bill. If you're going to impose a duty of consideration, have the full gamut. Okay, no, that's super. Um, I also wondered, um, you say in the written submission, whether there's any conflict between a statute and the code of practice, the statute will prevail. I wondered, where the statute's silent, what's the, and the code of practice speaks to something, uh, but where does that stand legally if we went to judicial review, for example? You, in the existing bill, you require compliance with the code. And so um, if that's the case, then in any judicial review, it would be expected that you comply with the code. This is, this is stronger than guidance. You're imposing duties on people in terms of the code. So does, does that mean that from a sort of technical point of view, the code could change the law in this area well, and change the thresholds or, the, or where proportionality sits in, in theory? It couldn't change um, human rights issues. If, if something was contrary to human rights, um, then the human rights would prevail and anything that was in the code would either have to be read down or disregarded. Um, it couldn't change something that was imposed by European regulation because a European regulation prevails over domestic law until we leave the European Union. And then we're in the hands of the bill which uh, came out last Friday from the Westminster Parliament. <laughs>
Yeah, um, I think the, the bill could usefully, I think, set out a number of ground rules around this. The bill should set out what the law is, the code of practice should say how you implement it and shouldn't be creating any new rules or new standards or new tests. It might set out or clarify which tests the existing law expects you to apply. Um, the kind of logical sequence of events here should be, as one of you had mentioned previously, you know, is sharing the information going to assist the well-being of the child, however we define well-being? If yes, then you proceed to go to, not immediately, can I legally share it? I think the first question you need to ask is, can I share this without consent? And the reason that question comes first is so that you're not then going through this mock <coughs> exercise of seeking a consent when you've actually decided you'll share it anyway. If the information is sufficiently important that you feel you should be sharing it without consent, then arguably you're probably going beyond well-being anyway and you're starting to stray into child protection territory. You know, would be my thinking on this one, I'm thinking this through as we're here. Um, sharing without consent is something that the Supreme Court were very, very um, against in terms of their ruling. So if you've actually got information that you think is sufficiently important that it should be shared without consent, part of me is thinking you've gone past well-being, you're into, starting to stray into child protection territory. If it doesn't pass that threshold, then you come into the ask for consent and then try and figure out how you do that in a way that's compatible with the GDPR requirement that says if there's a power imbalance, consent is not always going to be appropriate. Something, the code of practice might usefully address that kind of area. Um, I could say a code of practice that says when seeking the consent from the young person or the parent, you must make it absolutely clear that there will be no adverse consequences if they say no. Because if that isn't made clear, and I appreciate Janice's experience is that that's not how it works in practice at the moment, um, if that isn't made clear to the person, then you can't really say that they've given a freely informed voluntary consent. So that's a level of detail I would anticipate I could actually. That's, uh, that's very helpful. Uh, my final uh, question comes back to a point made by Daniel Johnson uh, around the, the sort of statutory sort of uh, nature of the code of practice and the fact that there's no direct uh, parliamentary scrutiny or, or vote. Because uh, I, um, I was quite interested in the fact that the bill team last week said that their thinking had been influenced by some approving comments made by the Supreme Court in relation to a statutory um, code of practice in relation to policing uh, in their judgment. But I mean, when you go back and look at uh, the code of practice that they refer to, it was introduced, I think, to uh, the Westminster Parliament uh, by statutory instrument. You need a statutory instrument you know, in order to lay uh, those codes before Parliament. Do you think that that's something that would be appropriate in this case, given the quantity uh, of complex legal information that will have to be contained within the Code of Practice. That's a policy matter, isn't it, as to what this committee is prepared to do and recommend to the Parliament. But do you think, and sorry, in the court's, Supreme Court's judgment, do you think that in their reference to that, they recognise there was a difference between a statutory Code of Practice that required the express approval of Parliament and a Code of Practice which is drafted by ministers at their sort of discretion. Do you think there's a dis legal distinction between the quality of those you two You could read that in terms of what Lord Reid said. I see you could read it, but I'm not in the mind of Lord Reid, so well, I don't really know. But you think that's a, do you think there's a possible yes, distinction? Yes, it is. And I think if you, if you read through, I think I made a note of paragraph 84 and paragraph 100 in the um, judgment of the um, Supreme Court, which I thought reflected somewhat on this, and uh, it's probably consistent with your comment. Thank you. Okay, uh, can I just say that it could possibly mean anything, uh, but uh, Claire, you wanted to come in. I just wanted to come in on, on a point that Kenny, Kenny Meakin made there about uh, giving consent and you know adequate consent to share information and a power imbalance. Surely there's already a power imbalance in most um, areas where you give consent, if you give consent to an operation. You know, uh, you're giving, there's a power imbalance between the surgeon and yourself. You give consent to a lawyer to do something, there's a power imbalance there. So that already exists. It already exists, yes. Um, that, that was all I wanted to clarify. Thank you. Uh, can, can I just, before I move, before I move on to, uh, through the chair, Tavish, uh, before I move on to Daniel, can I just, one comment that, that Oliver made. If something's on the face of the bill, 
it becomes much more difficult to, um, to change or amend at a later stage if circumstances change. And surely we shouldn't be suggesting that something should be in the face of the bill when we are facing the changes that we're going to be facing with legislation in Westminster. Surely what we should be doing is the, the code of practice, which is much more flexible, should be, should be there so that we can change it according to circumstances. I think I said previously that when you take everything else away, ultimately this bill is a vehicle for the statutory code of practice. Given the importance that the Supreme Court has placed on that, um, I wouldn't suggest that, that content of the code should be within the primary legislation. And I don't think that would be appropriate at all. I think you do need more flexibility. But I would suggest that given that it's critical importance to making this work in a human rights compatible way, then it probably should be contained within secondary legislation to allow full parliamentary discussion of it rather than simply being laid before the parliament. Although that's not how uh, it's, it's generally done here. It's usually not being done on the back of a Supreme Court decision that says if you don't get this code of practice right, then you're not going to be compliant with the law. Well, but every single part of legislation has to be compliant with the law, so I don't really see that that makes any difference at all, except for the fact that, the, the, that it's been brought back to us. The same principles apply when we were doing this originally. We had to make sure it was compliant with the law, and the Supreme Court says in that case we weren't quite. But the, the same principle applies with this as it does with any other piece of legislation. Oliver, you wanted to come briefly back in. Sorry, uh, just on the point of timing, because it's come up again and I meant to, to, to ask it. Do you think now is a good time to look at this area of law at all, or given the points you've mentioned in answer to the convener, it would be better, you know, with it being a moving target and things, just to, to wait a while and see, you know, where things settle? You're being asked to pass legislation that's compatible primarily with data protection law. And I think you've given yourselves a near impossible task given that data protection law is in flight at the moment and that it might actually be more sensible to defer to detailed discussion of this until such time as the UK Data Protection Act has been passed at Westminster. To that would be that uh, we didn't set the timetable for Westminster, but also the protection of our children shouldn't be held in abeyance until Westminster decide what their legislation should be. The Daniel, would you know? No, no, no. Daniel, would you like to come in? No. The, Oliver, Oliver. I've moved on. Daniel. Thank you, convener. Um, if, if I can briefly paraphrase, I think what you said at the beginning of your evidence uh, was that essentially the. The, 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 the conflict inherent within the law previously has been resolved, but uh, to, to, to create a kind of a, a more difficult decision for, for practitioners. As legal professionals, could you maybe just bring out kind of how finally balanced that decision would be for you as legal professionals with your understanding of the law? So you're saying I put myself into the position of yes. the primary school teacher. Exactly. And I say, well, a um, piece of information has come into my possession. Um, should I be sharing this with social work? And uh, so I'm having to go through uh, an exercise which at the moment I don't have adequate guidance for. Um, I'm going to have to say to myself, well, does this piece of information impact on some aspect of the Shinari test? Does it impact on the way this child is achieving? Yeah. Um, and what does that mean? And is it necessary to share this information to allow this child to achieve better? And if I don't share the information, what is the effect of that? And if I'm thinking of sharing the information, um, is it going to be a proportionate sharing? That is, um, is the sharing of the information going to take, can result in a problem which is more serious than not sharing the information? And the thought of a primary school teacher sitting down at four o'clock in the middle of marking a load of books and thinking this one through without help and trying to make their way through a code of practice on things which I as a lawyer would find difficult in the knowledge that if they get it wrong, it's going to be raised in a court of law strikes me as be being something which would be unattractive. Yeah. So, to my primary school teacher. Does that, does that give yeah. the sort of flavour? Um, Mr Beacon, would you agree with that? And, and, and would you say even as a, a legal professional that would be a difficult decision to make? Um, as a legal professional, where I would normally be involved in this would be providing the legal advice to a practitioner. Um, 
typically in this area it would have been social workers that I'd have been dealing with rather than education professionals, but the principle is the same, that I can provide the legal framework for them, but they're also the people who have practitioner knowledge and experience and skills that I don't have. So it's not purely a legal question. You know, I, I can very readily say, I've looked at this and here's the law. Not readily, it's a difficult question even for a lawyer. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't know about child welfare. I'm not someone who works with young people as a professional. So I'm dependent on the social workers or the teachers or the healthcare workers to actually provide their input into that process. Okay. Um, I, I can envisage an awful lot of people who are given named person responsibilities having their legal department on speed dial. Hmm. Um, just, so just following up on that, I mean, uh, uh, Janice Scott, you raised the Shinari indicators. I mean, it strikes me that if you look at things like included and achieving, you're talking about asking professionals to consider sharing data in, in, in areas which I think before this legislation, you wouldn't even begin to consider sharing them at all. Is that, is that a fair <coughs> statement to make? I think it is a fair statement to make, yes. So you're opposing an additional duty of consideration, but that's only the first step in determining whether or not the data should be shared. Okay. And, and just finally, and just following on from some of the comments uh, and questions asked by Joanne Lament about evidence and, and actually how you would make this decision, I mean, it, it strikes me that by stating this duty to consider in law that, 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 that people will be subject to, to challenge as to whether or not they, they considered adequately on, on both sides of, of, of that equation. I mean, I just was wondering if you could just explain what you think the potential legal liabilities and like consequences both for service providers but also individual practitioners may be. Do you think they'll be challenged as to whether or not they've adequately considered and is, it, is the danger more in terms of when they share, or even might it be actually more when they, they decide not to share that they might get challenged? I mean, it's, it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't um, situation. And uh, you've brought that home to these professionals who are involved yeah. in the welfare of children. Now, in cases where um, there is an obvious child protection concern, then of course you share, but you don't need this legislation to do that. We're doing it anyway. And the legislation adds nothing. What the legislation adds is um, a duty to consider in circumstances where you wouldn't previously have considered. And so in my field of work, I'm, I'm dealing with litigation regarding children. Um, if um, it is found in the litigation between parents that a teacher has shared something when perhaps they shouldn't have shared something and it's come out and escaped into litigation, there will be criticism. That would be the sort of field where I would come into, into this. At the very worst, if, um, litigate, if um, data was shared absolutely inappropriately, of course, there's a fine and there's damages payable by the relevant authority. And that will come under the General Data Protection Regulation and be rather more severe than it is at the moment. But one would hope one never, would never get to that. That is the most extreme. The, the least extreme is simply criticism. Is it conceivable, though, that, that teachers and health visitors might, might end up facing litigation? Potentially. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought they would face personal litigation in the absence of bad faith of some sort. Simply making the judgment call incorrectly, I think, would come back to the employing organisation rather than to the individual. That's helpful, thank you. Uh, OK, uh, I'm just going to let Tavish and... Uh, you know, ju just on Daniel Johnson's question about do, does a teacher or could a teacher potentially face litigation, but this Parliament's going to pass legislation next year making head teachers um, specifically accountable in law for their schools. That could mean, if not the, the primary teacher or the sorry, the, the particular teacher, the, the head teacher as the as it were the corporate person responsible for that school. And that drives down responsibility from the local authority yeah, to the school absolutely. itself. Yes, I can see that. Yeah. I can understand that. One would hope it wouldn't happen. Indeed, of course not. But there is that potential, which you'd concede. Yes. Thank you. OK. Um, thank you, Colin. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to go back a little bit more on this question of consent. Both your organisations have indicated that uh, you would like explicit reference to consent on the face of the bill. Is that really necessary? Isn't that adequately covered in the code of practice? I think 
there's a non so there's a non-consensual element in the bill as it currently stands. Um, the provisions that relate to a change in service provider actually say the outgoing service provider will provide the details of the child or young person to the supposed incoming service provider. Um, that doesn't reference anywhere consent. It just places a straight duty on the outgoing service provider. That's made subject to the 26A tests of is it data protection compliant? The problem you have with that is that you're going into straight into that same logic puzzle that the Supreme Court wrestled with and concluded was such a weird question that it was unclear and therefore fell foul of the tests. Because it is simply the name and address of the young person in question, it can probably be done in a proportionate way. But we already have a non-consensual provision that's in there. Um, so I think you need to re recognise that. The requirement for consent, um, I think, would probably be more usefully be addressed by revising section, or sorry, clause 26B um, in terms of what the code of practice needs to do to actually say if you were having it in the primary legislation, but the primary legislation can set out the parameters of the code of practice, and I think it could usefully clarify that the code of practice must deal with the consent issues in relation to this. Can I come back on that and say it's, it's not just consent. We've talked a lot about consent, but it's also telling people the information has been shared. Um, one of the things that's focused on by Lord Reed in the Supreme Court is people won't necessarily know that their information will be or has been shared. And that's why our proposed amendment or suggestion to you was that people should be told if the information has been shared. You, there may be circumstances when you can't do it because it will be dangerous to the child. But in general, unless it's going to be dangerous and cause, uh, cause a real problem, surely people should know that this information has been passed on. It seems from what's been said today and some of what uh, your organisations have put forward here, you're indicating that consent in itself is not necessarily a gateway to, to uh, releasing information or sharing information. Consent, if you can do it validly under the GDPR tests, is a gateway for you to do it, subject to the caveats of how do you ensure that it is. Um, I was asked a question of, is there an existing power imbalance? Yes, there is, but what there isn't at the moment is a legal regulatory framework that makes that a particularly problematic issue. That is changing. So the existing power imbalances, yes, they do exist, but the legal consequence of that power imbalance will change come 26th of May next year. When I, when I look outside at what uh, the professionals out in uh, working with children and so on, what they're doing and what they're sharing at this time, is this so much different? Are we actually fundamentally changing these responsibilities? We are, I think, fundamentally changing how we approach it. Um, for my sins, I'm responsible for GDPR implementation in my own organisation, and we're having to begin the message for staff to say, this is actually a fundamentally different way we're going to have to work. I've spent the last 17 years that the Data Protection Act has been enforced saying to people, get consent, get consent, get consent. I'm not going to spend the rest of my career probably saying, are you really sure you want to ask for consent? I don't think that's the way forward for you. So I think there is a fundamental shift being driven by GDPR in terms of how we engage with people. That change across the board also needs to be reflected within this legislation. Are you saying that that affects people who at present are engaged in fields where they would have to consider and decide on sharing information? Yes. At the moment, if I can give the example of a social work department, we have a social work information system which records client consent to holding the information, sharing the information with the health board and so on. Actually, when we analyse that in GDPR terms, what we should be going back and saying to the clients of the social work department is, now that we've looked at this against the new legal framework, if you want to engage with our services, we have to be able to process your information in this way. So for the core service delivery, we won't be using a consent model anymore because that's actually misleading now if you look at it in those terms. So we'll be saying to people, you have the choice to engage with our services or not. If you choose to engage with our services, we must be able to do this with your information. On the back of that, there will be additional services that we can offer to people where we would be seeking consent. Um, an example of given would be income maximisation. So if you engage with social work because you have an addictions problem, we need to be able to process your information to support you with your addictions issues. That's a given. We can't do it without having your information. But we could also take that information and pass it to another team who can look at it and say, 
you know what, there's actually a number of benefits out there that you would be eligible for that you're not presently getting. There's a number of services you can engage with that you're not presently getting. We would need the consent of the individual to do that extra piece of work, because that wouldn't be the core service that they were engaging with. That would be an add-on, and we would be looking to seek consent for that kind of additional work. So that's a, the that's a kind of thought process that we're actually having to change the mindsets within the organisation ahead of GDPR coming in. It is a big change. So given that there's this, what appears to be, from what you're saying, a fairly fundamental change in the way that the professionals are going to have to approach this in the future anyway, and that it's being driven at this moment, is there a benefit, or I would say there probably is a benefit, in getting this right in terms of named person, because it would create a structure through which they can operate? Absolutely. But if you take the example I just gave of the social work with the add-on service, I think we can make consent work here, but it needs to be driven very carefully in terms of how we approach it. And Janice, from discussing this previously, has instances where consent at the moment isn't exactly freely given in the context of how it's approached by the professional saying, we need you to sign this form or else. You know, they've got a signature on a piece of paper. Is that a freely given consent? No, it isn't. So all these complexities are out there at this moment and rather gathering force. So there is a bit of an impetus to get this right. Absolutely. Thank you. OK, well, thank you very much for that. Uh, I'd like to thank you for attending today and giving us your words of wisdom. Uh, and we will have a, uh, we'll suspend for a few minutes to allow the next panel of witnesses to take their seats. Thank you very much. <laughs>
I now welcome to the meeting um, Dr. The Professor Alison McCallum, apologies for the, the wrong title, Director of Public Health and Health Policy, NHS Lothian, Professor Hugo Van Worden, Director of Public Health, NHS Highlands, Valerie White, Consultant in Dental Public Health, NHS Dumfries and Galloway, Jean Cowie, Pr Principal Educator, NHS Education for Scotland, Annette Holliday, Health Visitor and Member of Unite, and Lorna Green, Policy Officer, Royal College of Nursing Scotland. And before I start, I, I should mention that Professor Van Worden, Valerie White and Jean Cowie are appearing as individuals who work for health boards. Their perspective is not necessarily representative of their employers. In addition, Annette Holliday is appearing as a health visitor and an accredited member of UNITE. Um, could I ask Colin to kick off the questions, please? Thank you. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about sharing information and uh, what scenario you have at this time in connection with your current practice for sharing information on well-being with and without consent. Would someone like to maybe give me a little bit of a rundown on that? Um, I'm happy to, to take that. I think we had been, in dentistry, we had been moving towards um, the implementation of the Children and Young People Act. Um, it was a, a different sort of threshold that we were looking at, you know, the thresholds for sharing information if there is a child at risk of significant harm are quite clear, that child protection. So there was a bit of a cultural shift in terms of sharing information in terms of um, health and health and wellbeing concerns, which needed a lot of education, training and support to, to do that. Um, until um, the... Um, the, the Supreme Court ruling, um, we had been on, on the understanding that there was a duty to share that information, um, regardless of whether or not there was consent, if there was a health and wellbeing concern. Um, so that was the path that we had anticipated that we would be going down. Since um, there has been the Supreme Court ruling, um, we are, um, I, I suppose, um, the, the level of um, confusion as to what, what we can and what we can't share in terms of that threshold level does now appear to be a bit confusing to us. You know, we're clear if it's child protection concerns that we share that, if it's wellbeing, I, I think we, we are struggling with that at the moment. Typically in the past, what information would you share? Usually with dental services, it would have been um, it would have been if there was significant risk of harm to that to that child. So if there was a child protection issue, then that would have yeah. been shared. And that would typically be without consent, because of course, child protection overrides. Yeah, the good, best practice would be obviously to seek consent if that was a if that was a possible. But obviously, child protection overrides that, so it would have happened, and referrals would have been made to social services in, in those instances where that concern was laid there. Does anyone share information with consent? Or, or does it always come down to child protection or similar overriding issues? We would always share in practice, we would obviously, um, in discussion with the parent, especially if I was wanting to discuss with um, other involved professionals, I would be asking the parent if it's all right, if I could contact those involved. Um, an example would be for developmental issues for a child, for example. So I might be wanting discussion with the nursery around how they're supporting that, um, our speech and language colleagues, um, discussion with the GP about health issues. They're not all child protection related. And how do you think that this, uh, this uh, requirement to consider sharing information might affect the way that you operate at the moment? Um, I think part of the background is historically health professionals have uh, worked on the basis of an assumption of confidentiality so that nothing is shared unless there is consent or there is some public benefit reason. Um, so I think that's why that's um, that historic assumption of complete confidentiality unless as a starting point. Ex Professor Warden, the, the you said public benefit reason. Are we not talking about exactly the same thing here, except that we may well have lowered the bar to what we consider to be a public benefit? And, and this, 
in this case, the, the welfare of the child as opposed to the protection of the child? The yeah. well-being <coughs> of the child, sorry. The well-being yeah, of the child. I think yeah. you're right. I think Thank that you. is fundamentally what, what it is, is a change of, of where the bar is in relation to that. The slight risk of a clash then is with professional, as Professor Alison McCallum has pointed out, is with a clash with professional guidance uh, for, say, doctors where the General Medical Council um, would put a bar in a, in a particular position. Okay, Professor McCallum, would you like to come um, in? Yes, I wanted to make two points, really. One, one is about the infrastructure within which we share information for the purposes of providing services to children and families, and I mentioned that in um, the evidence from NHS Lothian which is that we have certain duties under NHS and Education Acts to work together to provide safe, effective care for children. Um, and that includes things like immunisation, ensuring that children have the support that they need should developmental issues become a problem, that there isn't um, a lack of a framework for that to happen when an individual family comes forward. Um, so the, there's one bit for me about ensuring we have the right framework that allows information to be shared for the benefit of children when it's appropriate to do so. Um, and the, the other is that um, we talk about consent when we mean both working with children and families to engage them in services, to come to a shared view of the best way forward and when we're talking about formal consent for procedures. And the duty to consider sharing information seems to me to be an appropriate phrase that allows you to engage children and families to, become, to come to a shared view, even if you're, it's not appropriate to go down the route of obtaining formal consent, which the child, older children and families could withdraw. To situations where um, it's a sort of a professional relationship with the family or whatever, and a decision is made within that context as to the best way to care for whichever member of the family requires the care, as opposed to sharing information with perhaps third parties, which, it, which, it, which is perhaps the more contentious side. Um, I the, the framework that we have in place in Scotland at the moment allows us to have formal relationships between, for example, the health service and the local authority and with third sector organisations and to agree in line with the Data Protection Act what information is shared for the purposes of providing services. Because Local authorities don't provide all services themselves. Some of those are provided under contract to third sector organisations. And so it's important that the frameworks that we've put in place to enable people to seek help um, don't get closed off because of concerns about sharing information that children and families have already um, signed up to as part of an engagement with service. For me, most of the work that we do around appropriate sharing of information is, um, as far as possible, coming to a shared view about the best way forward and then agreeing what sort of information would be shared in what format, rather than it being a blanket yes or no. One second, Lorna Green wanted to come Colin, I wonder if you could repeat your original question there about the changes to information sharing, because I just want to make sure I answer correctly there. The changes to information yeah, sharing? your question there, was that a, you were asking about what the implications might be? Yes, um, given that there is a, it's proposed to be a requirement to consider sharing information, how does that change current practice, the way you're operating at the moment? Will it have a significant impact? Uh, the RCN thinks it, it could potentially have quite a significant impact in the form of leading to defensive practice. Um, so by putting in this duty to consider um, that you're leading professionals towards what might become a tick box exercise and which could take away from meaningful practice. Um, and we would see that as ultimately perhaps having the opposite effect of what the Scottish Government would like in terms of um, 
implementing the in-person, which is about achieving the principles of GERFEC. And we think that really is best achieved by allowing professionals to develop trusting relationships with the people they're providing services to um, and giving them the most time possible to engage meaningfully with the people they're giving services to by implementing or by introducing a duty to consider we're worried professionals might find themselves becoming nervous and wanting to um, evidence and um, sort of cover all their bases, which would take time away from that meaningful face-to-face -face interaction. So that's what we would see as, as the potential negative impact of, of that duty to consider on practice. Has the uh, Supreme Court decision had any impact at this point in terms of your confidence to be able to continue as you as you are in sharing information so just to clarify i'm not a clinician i'm not I'm a practitioner i'm a policy officer so i'm not out there on the coal face delivering that kind of care but what we do hear from our members um is that as a result of the judgment um, there is confusion and there is nervousness and what was being done as best practice and what had been taken forward um as a as a good um you know, we're, we're very positive about um, the principle behind the in-person and what was seen as a good um, policy change is now um, at threat because practitioners are increasingly nervous. And that's, that's because of a combination of factors, including the um, negative media that surrounded this and the controversy that's followed it. And as part of what we've um, done in our engagement with the Scottish Government is we've been very clear that we think some of the messaging needs to change around um, name person to make it clear that what it is fundamentally about is building trusting relationships which are about supporting people and working in partnership with families and children and that's what our members as health visitors set out to do every day and it's about making sure that their practice is as meaningful as possible and we're concerned that that duty to consider could get in the way of the meaningful part of the practice. Is that I was just going to ask if anyone else has uh, similar concerns about the Supreme Court decision. Well, again, it's about that uh, defensive practice, and I think we do see defensive practice happening now anyway, um, regardless of whether a named person was there or not. I think people do get nervous about things. Um, there, there are concerns sometimes about you know, that professional... Um, regulation etc so defensive practice is part and parcel of everyday health as in practice that's interesting daniel you wanted to come out at this point uh, yes i mean i'm very interested in this the point about defensive practice uh, and in particular the rcn in your um submission have said that that you think that the duty to consider um uh, may undermine the principles of Ger uh, 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 by resulting in this defensive practice that's quite a strong statement can you maybe just draw out kind of what you think the the the, the impacts and consequences uh, will be of that on the ground if, if that were to come about? I think what we mean by that is um, if you go back to where name person came from and where the concept you know sort of took off, and you look at Highland as the example, um, there's it's really positive as an example of what happens when um, practitioners are allowed to develop meaningful relationships and build trust and um, when information takes place in a way that's appropriate and in line with um, uh, you know, kind of legal parameters that are already there. So what we see, and that happened as part of best practice, and we see that as being a really great contributor to GERFEC and promoting and supporting well-being. What we see here with the um, duty to consider is that idea of one affecting meaningful practice, two turning it into a tick box exercise, and three affecting the time that's available to professionals to provide that face to face support. And that's really, really key if you're looking at the original place where this, this concept began. It was the time, it was the relationships that got built. And we think that is key to GERFEC. Um, it's key to work in partnership with children and families. It's key to offer support. So we don't want to see those principles get undermined by a reduction in the time available and more time spent at a desk shifting through paperwork. Actually, Nick, if I could just come to you, uh, and you can maybe answer uh, along with this. I mean, one of the points the Bill team made was that essentially that this duty to consider, which I think, first of all, I hope you agree, and that's the, the, the key change, I think, to practitioners, it's a new consideration they have to make. Essentially, just a continuation of the professional judgments that practitioners will be making day to day. 
Do you think it is the same kind of decision and judgment, or do you think it's a different kind of judgment? And, and what kind of level of, of uh, additional pressure do you think this new duty may or may not bring about on, on the ground? Um, well, I think that there's definitely, uh, with some of the Griffith principles, there's definitely changes to decision-making practices yeah. in health and practice currently. So that, therefore, does create um, differences. Um, the issue around time, etc., goes back to resource and being able to ensure that you have an, a, an adequate number of health visitors or beyond adequate number of health visitors so that time can be spent with families and shared decision-making can happen. Because we know that that is a longer, slower process than if we move to that sort of fix-it model of professional knows best. Mm -hmm. So these things take time, they take energy to build. And if we are not resourced enough, then we, we move back to that sort of tick bo box exercise of, of making sure we're covered rather than working in true partnership with the families. And just, just further to that point, I mean, one of my concerns is that uh, health visitors will be named persons for children beyond the point they might ordinarily have contact, and you mentioned when they're at nursery and so on. I mean, is that a concern in terms of just ensuring that there's sufficient contact in, in a, you know, to enable health visitors to even have the, 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 the experience to make those considerations in the first place? Well, of course, the, the idea is that we have an enhanced universal pathway uh, that is brought in when, again, we are resourced enough to be able to deliver that, and that will return the additional contacts that we're lacking um, in our old, where there was three minimum contacts for a health visitor, uh, and we'll move to 11, and one of them will be um, in the, the preschool year. And health visitors have, over time, built up very good communication with nurseries. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, if, as long you know, no health board has yet implemented the universal pathway contacts, and that does create concerns about how, you know, the length of time before children are seen, and it does go back to resource. I've just got one final question, if I may. Um, I mean, one of the points that was just raised by the previous panel, um, uh, by the, the fact of advocates in particular, was that this may well lead to uh, a legal challenge, certainly of service providers um, and, 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 and perhaps of practitioners. Is that a concern to, to, to RCN and, and Unite? And, and what sort of the what level of, of, of uh, consideration have you given to that, that prospect? Um, legal challenges to the practitioner? Mm, or the service provider? Um, I think there's certainly nervousness about where responsibilities lie yeah. around delivering of named person services. Okay. Certainly for the RCN, um, we're very concerned about that. Um, it is within that bill that its service provider slash organisation has this duty to consider. But when you think about that, um, how does an organisation consider? That's a very vague strange concept and the reality is it takes a person to consider it also takes a person to evidence that they've considered um, organizations can delegate duty and when they delegate duty they delegate it to professionals who are individuals so we are concerned that this would affect our members that our members could find themselves exposed um, to professional risk that wasn't there previously and is disguised in this bill by hiding behind words like organizations and service providers Thank you, Man, at this point. The, the advice we got that was that it's the organisations that are responsible for this and not the individuals. Uh, and th that's, that's the way it's been written. I mean, I, the, the bill's not law yet, you know, but that's certainly the advice that, that we've got from... from uh, excuse, think, me, excuse, me, ex excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, Daniel. I'm speaking. That, that's the advice that we got from our support team before this committee today. Uh, but anyway, I mean, as I say, we're still through the process uh, and, and we'll see how that works out. But what I'm trying to do is put your mind at ease that the, there's not a trap here for, for the practitioners to be, to be caught. Professor McCallum. Um, thank you. We already face um, challenges from um, parents, uh, parents particularly who do not want, wish information to be shared about their children and that does impact on the way that we provide immunisation services, for example, because we are required under the NHS Act to 
offer immunisation to all children and it's really important that we have positive child identification so that we can identify those children for whom immunisation is not clinically appropriate but that everyone else can be offered and there is a point of um, consent where parent and indeed older children can refuse consent for immunisation but actually we need to know who every child is and where they go to school in order to provide universal services as well as to ensure that we have the infrastructure in place to provide additional support for children with, with chronic um, and ongoing problems. So this is already a problem to us. In the health service however we have Caldecott guardians, so people like myself, who take on that organisational responsibility. And I have an information governance assurance board that covers these issues and has two non-executive directors of the board on it. So we have that organisational cover. Um, when we work with local authorities, we have a partnership, but they don't have the same infrastructure that we do to enable those sorts of decisions to be taken professionally with legal advice, but not directed solely by the actual words that are written in the law. So there, there is an opportunity there for us to be moving to legal interpretation of things where actually that wasn't the original intention um, of this process. Okay, Professor Warden. Um, I have just a tiny small practical point. Um, is that it may be helpful if the guidance clarified how long information was stored for. Uh, you know, obviously, if there's duty to consider, uh, and then I think that's just a small practical issue that would be helpful. Okay, that's, thank you for that. That's helpful. I'd also like to raise that um, we understand the position about the organisation's responsibility, but that's very difficult when you're one person sitting in somebody's living room. And also that actually, certainly in health isn't practice, no other practitioner has your knowledge because no other practitioner builds up the same relationship at the same time. So the That's information you're taking back to your organisation is yours. No, I completely accept that. What I'm saying is that the, the umbrella cover is, is the cover of the organisation. It wouldn't be a holiday that would be held to account as, a, as the, the information we were given. It would be the local authority. I appreciate that, but I'm the, I'm the person holding that information and retailing it back to my employer. Yeah, and I no one else too. can independently verify that because they also haven't been in and around that child at the same uh, time. And, and therefore the organisation has placed trust in you and they're responsible for your, your behaviour on this one. Uh, so there's a couple of people want to come in. I'll, I'll come back to Lorna. Okay. Uh, Gillian? Some, I know a few of you were sitting in the, the, the gallery when the previous panel were in, and it was Janice Scott made a recommendation, and, and in their submission as well to us, that people are notified when data is shared about them. And given what you've just been talking about, what impact do you think that could potentially have on, on the, I suppose, the, the safety of children or the, you know... Uh, if, you've, if you've noticed that maybe a, a parent has refused care for a child that concerns you, and then they have to be n notified when you make, make another person aware of that, how does that impact? How could that impact? People want to um, obviously undertake good practice and get consent where, where that is appropriate, but there is that tension between, you know... Uh, how is that going to affect your ongoing relationship if you have to seek con consent? Um, and and that is that is a very difficult one because you do obviously have your professional obligations, but you don't want to you know to 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 to, to, to um, st stretch the relationship that you have with the family. And sometimes maybe if you if you were able to have an informal conversation with the named person about a low level concern that you had, that named person might be able to provide you with some reassurance about that or actually maybe say actually thanks very much I think I'm going to have to go and um, you know do some do some looking into that so I think it is a, it is a tension um, that, that is there had to be originated to let a parent know that you'd actually spoken to the named person that you think that, that could potentially in some cases be an, an issue 
I think I think potentially that could be a barrier. I mean, I, I think realistically there there historically has been nervousness even about maybe some child protection. You know, we've got over that now. We've moved pa we've moved past mm -hmm. that. But I think it is that cultural shift of a new threshold that we're that we're in in terms of of, of Garfic and that well-being approach and that supportive approach, which you know, if you're having to start sharing letters and things, can can make it difficult to seem like a supportive approach. Hold it and then Lorna Green. That the relationships can be fractured and it can be very difficult to restore. Um, and obviously at levels of child protection, there are other processes that come into play. Um, so at the level of wellbeing, there's you know, potential for more of that and perhaps even not quite the level of the framework of child protection that you've got to counterbalance that. It, it does come down to trying to have shared decision making and, and shared views with families and, and as practitioners being brave to go beyond that. But um, you certainly don't want fractured relationships yeah. with more families because they are damaging in the longer term. Thank you. Uh, Lorna Green. Um, well, just to answer that one, what I'd say is um, when the RCN has approached this, we've been quite clear in our approach that we see name person as part of an early um, intervention and prevention programme and that really um, well-being, conversations that concern well-being should for the most part be able to take place in a um, forum where there is consent and where you are having like a dialogue with the family and their children and if you are concerned to the extent where having had that conversation and you don't feel, you feel that child's at risk of harm, that is, that is really veering towards child protection, of which is a different conversation to this one. So I, I, I just think for us, we've tried to really focus on this as part of an early um, intervention prevention strategy and policy and, and keep it rooted in, in that domain. Um, the one thing I wanted to raise, though, was when we were talking a little bit earlier about um, the duty to consider and the impact on professionals, I just thought it's worth mentioning as well, because it hasn't been mentioned yet, is that duty to identify, because that's also there, and that also could have repercussions for professionals, because, it's again, it feels quite vague to us, and we're not entirely sure what's meant by it, and is it something that duty to identify is identify information that comes directly in front of you, or is it a duty to identify and further investigate? What does that mean for the role of the help visitor? And, you know, when we had these conversations with... Um, our legal um, professionals within our organisation, and, and they were just a little bit kind of concerned around that and flagged the potential to then turn this role into a little bit of a watchdog role even with that, that you should identify. It's not something we've explored a whole lot here, and I didn't hear it explored earlier in the other session either, but it's just something to definitely flag because we do think that could also have repercussions for our members. That's helpful, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ward. Yes, thank Professor you. Ward also. Um, I think trust is built on often on sharing and, and opening, openness and, and, and transparency. Um, and I think that I would certainly support the, that under normal circumstances, information that is being shared would be also that families or would be informed of that. Um, and for two reasons. First of all, I do believe it builds trust. And secondly, it provides the opportunity to correct matters of fact because often these are quite complex areas and it is possible that the professional may have some matters of fact incorrect. Okay. Thank you. Um, Joanne? Yeah. You, you want to come? Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm interested that we said that um, if there's a failure in the system, it would be the responsibility of the local authority of the health board. But what internally would happen within these organisations for them to protect themselves? And what consequences are there then for practitioners if the health board is saying, we're going to get into trouble for this, we want to make sure that our employees are all, you know, doing the right thing? Is that a different kind of pressure on people? And what, I mean, maybe to, to ask um, Annette, have you had training around this? Because presumably, from internal within an organisation, in order to protect itself, they want to make sure employees are doing the right thing. Um, yes, I mean, I'm not here to speak for my organisation, uh, so, but as a health minister, we've had training, although we've had training before the Supreme Court ruling, mm -hmm. so there would have to be update and changes to that um, regarding uh, the information sharing bill, is because when we got trained, it was about duty to share. Um, 
like anything, I think what you're asking, if there's failures there, I think it would follow the, the usual sort of investigatory proceedings. Mm. And I think practitioners are concerned about disciplinary proceedings against them. And have there been, within health boards, conversations about the nature of that disciplinary procedure, if there's a lack of clarity about what the expectation is? I can't answer that. I don't, I don't know. Um, certainly, from, um, from our point of view, there's been, a lot of, um, there's been a lot of training. And then with the Supreme Court judgment, there were further communications that went out that said, please continue to work in the current professional manner and to seek advice as, um, as appropriate. So the, um, the Child Health Commissioner sits on both our Board Information Governance Assurance Board and on our multi-agency data sharing partnership. So um, she and one of her support folk have a work programme that's designed to um, help as far as is um, help as far as is possible, ensure that people understand um, how to do their job and how the organisation is going to um, is going to support them. Okay. Thank you, um, Tavish. Then, Liz. Thank you. Can I just ask a couple of questions about the individual responsibility for decisions that you've been touching on this morning? Because I don't think that is clear. I think your concerns are clear. Um, but I'd just like to bottom out what those concerns are. We're t discussing not the principle of named person, we're discussing the, the draft bill in front of us and the code of practice, which you will have heard the earlier evidence of, lots of concerns about that. So as it is currently constituted, could the panellists possibly describe your concerns about what this means for individual responsibility for decisions? The code of practice specifically? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well... In engaging with the code of practice, I, I appreciate what you said earlier, Gillian, in that previous um, session because it is an illustrative code and in fact looking at that word illustrative that really says it's an example code so it in no way indicates what we could reasonably expect to see at the end of this whole process. Um, we as the RCN have engaged with the GERFEC team as part of what they're doing with stakeholders um, along with Unite and a few others and at those meetings we the most recent one we were told that that code of practice would more than likely look entirely different by the end of this whole process so for us we haven't actually spent much time engaging on it because one we we don't think this legislation is the right way um, to go about fixing um, what the judgment said about name person um, the name person sorry the 2014 act um, and we don't really see the point in engaging on something that's illustrative that could really change dramatically. So for us, there's not a whole lot we can sink our teeth into. The one thing I will say about it, though, is we haven't been given an assurance of where this will sit in relation to the NMC's code of practice. And what I mean by that is we are clear that anything that becomes um, law will, um, in a hierarchy, will come above the NMC code of practice. What we don't know is where do two codes of practice sit in relation to each other? Does one have a hierarchy over the other? Do they sit next to each other? We, we haven't been told that. And so that for us is, is probably the main concern at this stage, is getting clarification around that so that if eventually this does come about and we do have to comment further on a code of practice, we'll at least know where it sits in relation to what the NMC have. But uh, that's very fair. Um, the Parliament's being asked to pass legislation for, for, for a code of practice now, which is in draft, and as you've just said, we actually don't know what it could look like in the future. But yet the Parliament is being asked to pass that legislation which gives effect to that code. Mm -hmm. That's not the way it should be done, is it? Well, that's why we don't think exactly. this legislation is yeah. a good idea. Yeah. practical question, um, which relates to quite a few of the comments that you have. Given that the proposed change that is that you now have to make a decision about whether you should share the information or not, and you've just flagged up some of the codes that you would have to be cognizant of in order to do that, would any of you be able to quantify the amount of time that you would have to spend in your uh, daily job uh, ensuring that that was documented and obviously that you were accountable for why you had made a decision or in some cases why you hadn't chosen to pursue it? Would we be able to get from you any indication of the time that that might involve? 
I can probably answer from you know a, a, a dentist, sort of an independent contractor sector. If they had you know to sit and document and, and write all this down, that is not probably built into their daily routine of how they manage their their patients. So um, it would have a, you know it would have a significant impact in terms of time you know on them. But you know, I, I do think you know I'm hugely positive of getting it right for every child and the principles about it. Um, but I do think that how it actually works in practice to maximise, because I think general dental practitioners have a huge amount of you know information that they have, you know, that could support the health and well-being of, of of children. That you know, but that's not been factored into it. And, and there's probably other professions as well that that it would also have impacts on as well. I think the financial modelling's I mean, maybe on the health visiting aspect, but. I think it's much wider than that as well. So, Morton, and I, I believe I cut you off the last time. I was, you were about here, sorry, I didn't notice you. I know. I think the, there's um, implications for individual. There's also organisational uh, time resource in terms of the collation, the transmission across organ between organisations, and the storage, and then obviously eventually the disposal uh, safely of such information. Okay, thank you. Claire, you got a short... Uh, yeah, very briefly, just to come back on Lorna Green's point, and you may not have seen the submission that the NMC has, had made um, where they said that uh, their main interest was to make sure uh, that the, as the UK-wide regulatory provisions and any name person information sharing provisions in Scotland can operate beside the code, um, that they could currently see no conflict between the draft legislation proposed or their own regulatory approaches, notably the code. I, I so just to offer you that reassurance that they're obviously, they are engaged in this process, which they need to be. Sure. We, we, I have read that and we, they are part of that group that we are part of yeah. with the GERFEC team. Um, and that is correct. But what they say there is the legislation, they don't say the code of practice. Um, so they haven't commented on the code of practice because they are aware, as we are, that that isn't the final code of practice. Absolutely. So that's, Absolutely. that's still our concern. I guess it's just to offer reassurance to particularly registered nurses and midwives who may be watching this that the NMC are involved they in are. this. Yes, and, and we're are working with them as well. this process, which yeah. is really important. Thank you very much. The Ruth. Good morning, panel. Thanks for being here. One of the um, strong themes that came through the submissions was the need for um, training and guidance on um, information sharing. I'd just be interested to hear the panel's reflections on um, the experience, perhaps, of the training that was provided for the 2014 Act and the type of training that you think would be most useful. And also, we've heard that, um, obviously, GERFEC is to cut across all um, teams who are working with children. So how wide do you think the, the, the training you know, needs to be? Well, the training um, needs to go across all professional groups. Um, certainly, NES have been involved in developing resources online modules, um, but they've been on hold until decisions have been made about the information sharing. Um, but the, the training needs to be sustainable um, and practical with real life examples and scenarios to work through and to explore decision making. And it needs, it needs to be sustainable. And I think there needs to be, um, to support the training, the systems of supervision are in place to support practitioners with their decision making. Um, and I know they've been looking then at, at supervision in the nursing field. Um, I'm not quite sure what's happening in other professional groups, but with regard to um, making sure or ensuring that there's consistency across the board, I think there maybe needs to be a, a model or a system of supervision across professional groups as well. The, the different professionals have different models of supervision at the moment, so is, yeah. is that something that's mm -hmm. going to be challenging for them? Possibly. Okay. Hey. Sorry. Um, I would probably say, again, uh, the, the training around bringing in the other aspects of the Act where we are challenging um, to the workforce. And um, there was also where practice um, support was required, so people were able to go and access training, but actually putting that into their practice and changing models of practice um, was was hugely challenging, and is still not fully embedded in 
um, so we, I think practitioners... And what, what lessons can we learn from those challenges? Was there something specific that... It's a big question. <laughs> that is a big question. <laughs> um, I, I don't. Well, I don't know. I do know. I was involved in my own organisation for the uh, rolling out of training around the national practice model, and and we had a two day training for health visitors. And then I think there was an expectation in the organisation that people would then go off and start to implement. And okay. very quickly, we realised that that would not happen. And we are still embedding the change and it will come down to more supervision at times of change, it will come down to um, caseload management decisions, it might come down to more audit, etc, etc. So there, there's a huge, I think, resource implications. We also had the, the NACE training after that, okay. so um, there was the organisational one and the wider, and it's still not fully in. Sure. Okay. Professor Wharton. Yeah, just... Um, reflect slightly wider on training. If you are going to train uh, somebody to ask a child, can you count to one to five? It's very simple, isn't it? Because the child either can or can't count to one to five. So um, I think what was referred to in the last session as well is, and would be in terms of a test like Shanari, you've always got a risk of what's called false positives and false negatives. In other words, that there is a problem, but you don't spot it, or that you think that there's a problem and that there isn't. And the challenge is that um, you're trying to do that across, you know, the Shinari's safe, healthy, achieving, nurtured, active, respected, responsible, and included. So one of the challenges with the test is, is it, uh, is it administered identically by all people with the same threshold? Uh, and um, that is challenging in the context. I don't know that there's been any academic work around Shinari to, to explore whether there is inter-individual variation around you know, the threshold of assessment of well-being. So that's one of the challenges with training, is how do you train people on a test that's not a simple, you know, does the strip turn pink or red, you know, pink or blue? With, with the professionals we're speaking about, though, and I think, I mean, if you, if you think about child development, you're, you're kind of making judgments on that anyway, based on the, the situation. Some of the time it's not always black and white, is it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Professor McCallum, would you want to come in there? Um, yes, it was just to, to build on um, Professor Van um, Worden's points, really, that um, in line with best educational practice, um, to ensure that everyone can most of the time practice at the level that you would expect them to, um, seven and a half hours of training um, is going to provide awareness raising. It's going to highlight um, gaps in confidence and gaps in ongoing skills that then need to be filled using um, scenarios to test decision making, support systems that allow people to have their decision making checked out. Um, and ongoing support as new scenarios come along that people need, and new evidence comes along that people need to learn from. So for me, it's, it, it has to be seen as a really important comprehensive programme that links with early intervention, prevention and support. And um, even as a, a marginal additional intervention, seven, seven and a half hours is, is, is only going to give us a false sense of security. I ask maybe, uh, Jean Cowie, this might be your area of expertise, but when, when new things like this come in and, and there are, are new training regimes put in place, do they not eventually just become part of the, the educator's role or whoever would be responsible for training within that organisation and become part of, of, of you, know, you know, the whole training as opposed to a, a sort of standalone? Um. For example, then, with regard to the um, introduction of the health system pathway, for example, we would have updated, we provided CPD days to upskill the workforce. But as Alison says, it, it's more a rare awareness reason, and, and you do expect people, practitioners, to go and learn more. Um, and you're right, we did educate or uh, have um, sessions with the educators of the health visiting courses in Scotland to ensure that the courses um, 
delivering a health minister education, were um, addressing the key requirements and priorities for Scotland and the pathway at that time. And the uh, Children and Young People Act was part of that. But again, as um, Annette pointed out, it was a couple of years ago and yeah. it constantly needs to be um, revisited. And, um, so, uh, and eventually then it would just become part of, again, I'm using yeah. your role, it would just become part of the, the training for a, a new recruit into nursing? Or, over over or, a period of time. Yeah. But I think it will probably take a, a, quite a while yeah. to get it integrated properly. Okay, thank you for that. Lorna, I believe you were one. Um, the word comprehensive was used earlier, and I think that's a word that's missing in what we've seen so far in terms of what training will be provided. It does feel like it's pretty um, one-off, a one-off process, and um, we don't feel assured there's something comprehensive to, to back that up to ensure the delivery going forward. The other th thing to pick up on is something Annette mentioned, which is resources, and resources being massively important when we're talking about training, not just in terms of funding the training itself, but making sure that when people are out undertaking CPD or further training, that there's backfill available, that there's cover available, um, and also that idea of supervision. If you're going to introduce 500 new health visitors into the workforce, those 500 new health visitors will need access to supervision as they're going about doing their day-to-day -day job because they're new to the role. Um, as much as they will be very well trained, that is very important in terms of taking forward their job. Um, and that will that will have an impact on, on what resource, or sorry, the resources that are um, put into the profession will have an impact there. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ross and then Oliver. Thanks, Convener. Just coming off the back of Warner's point about the need for the resourcing of training to be adequate, the financial memorandum attached to this bill sets out, I think it's just under a million pounds for health boards uh, for the training. Is that adequate? That around 800 extra health visitors was required to deliver um, the increased contacts in the universal pathway and for best practice to happen rather than the 500 that... Um, that was set out by government. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Lauren. This could potentially have an impact on um, the budgets of services where the training is provided on a one-off basis and that funding has been provided, but for ongoing training or for training for professionals beyond health visitor roles, for example, who may be impacted by the name person um, role, that where would that, where would that funding come from? It might have to be found within services and that again is challenging at a time when resources are very tight. Um, I'm not answering your question totally directly but I think it's part of the modelling there is the assumption as I understand it that where an intervention is required that that will on average be I think 10 hours because I think the, the important thing here is that for early prevention to work you have to have what I call a latent phase, a phase where something's not too bad a problem but you can detect it that you can detect it, and that when you detect it, you can do something about it that, that makes a real difference. In other words, you know, you've got an intervention which changes the trajectory for that child. So I think the important bit is not so much just the detection, but the intervention thereafter that actually puts that child on a better trajectory. Thank you. And going back to the 2014 Act, um, do you believe there is adequate training in relation to that for practitioners who would be involved but weren't the name person? those who would be sharing information with the name person? Well, I can say, it's from, um, I don't think it went wider. I don't think it, it went wide enough. I think the, at the time it was about trying to train the people who would be named persons. Um, but I, I know there are other uh, health colleagues who, who are still not fully trained in GERFEC. And it maybe goes back to Ruth's point that in the same way that child protection had to go beyond women and children's, as it first came in and had to be recognised as board-wide or in all services, then perhaps if we're, if we're talking about well-being, the, the same would apply. Okay, uh, Valerie, wait, did you want to come in? Uh, I'd just say there, there, ha there was training provided by NAES in terms of for, for, for general dental practitioners and dental teams, but that's only the, the, the tip of the iceberg because there is that. It's ongoing. <coughs> you do need the local training in terms of, well, what is our local systems here? So it's it's not just the high level. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it goes, it filters right down the, the whole system and it, it does need to be applied to, to all professionals as well. Okay. Would the funding therefore be recurring or non-recurring funding, the £1 million 
for training. It was, was for 2018-19, that was one off. That's my understanding. Okay. Thank you. Finished? Right, thank you, Ross. Oliver. Thank you. Uh, can I start just with a simple question from a professional point of view? Do you think that the bill, as it's currently proposed, is easier or harder to understand than the original legislation? Yeah. I think it's positive in that it, it um, the aspiration is very clear to give you know children in Scotland the, a world class development, and I think that aspiration is a, a fantastic aspiration to have, and I think that the clarifications have been as a result of the Supreme Court uh, ruling. I think so. I think generally speaking, I think the thing is positive. I think there is a huge complexity underpinning that, as, as, as many people have alluded in different ways. Okay. Yeah. So the RCN is a supporter of Gurfec and we support the, name, the principle of the name person. With this bill, what we feel it introduces is, is vague concepts. So what we've talked about already, the duty to consider and the duty to identify, we don't feel that those are helpful concepts. So do, you think, do you think that makes the decision making process more complicated for professionals? than the original bill did. I think it's adding to the, the sort of burden of complexity and difficulty for professionals. Well, it's difficult to comment on that really because the original act, those parts that refer to information sharing were deemed um, to not fit in with um, human rights law or an EU law. And so whether or not they were easier to understand is kind of irrelevant because they weren't lawful. So that doesn't really matter. But what matters is that the bill that's in front of us now has vague concepts that we don't feel would necessarily aid professionals in providing a meaningful service that will achieve the best results that could be possible through a named person service. Thank you very much. Uh, and just one sort of further question around the recording of evidence and decisions. Um, I sort of wondered when you talk about supervision and consistency across different services and people getting the same sort of type of decisions being taken every time. How do you achieve that consistency without actually looking at the decisions that are being taken and looking at the information that people have decided not to share? How does someone supervise that process without understanding the, the actual decisions taken? Professor? Uh, it's complex, <laughs> you know that. Um, I think the area for me that I tried to highlight in my submission was particularly complex is around teenagers, where um, the question becomes, is the teenager competent to give consent on their own behalf or not? And I think that's one of the areas that the professionals would obviously have to make uh, decisions. Uh, my feeling was that there was a slight unintended um, mixed message in terms of what was being said in that by considering the well-being of a teenager, one is in effect saying that that teenager is not competent to consider and look after their own well-being, but at the same time, one might, one might be saying that that teenager was competent to make a decision about consent. So there is, I think, um, a difference with children under the age of 12 where that isn't the case. So I think there may be a fundamental difference. One theoretical approach that might clarify that would be just to have graphic applying up to the age of 12 and not applying to teenagers. That might be one potential solution. Or the alternative solution that reduces that mixed message is to say, if you're not competent to look after your own well-being in this area, you're not competent to give consent as well. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So, I just said, I suppose from a practitioner perspective, I don't actually think that legislation will ever be that that clear. It will always be very complex, and what underpins that is guidance um, that is supported by the, the key stakeholders for those professions. So in dentistry, you know, it's the General Dental Council, it's the defence organisations, you know, it, it, to, to, to try and, and help support, you know, that because the, the legislation will always be, it, by its very nature, will be complex and very difficult to, to interpret. So it's almost going to be that underpinning what's, what's below, even below that code of practice is actually probably what's going to be really, really important that those that, that, that is in place and agreed by key stakeholders so that we're all clear about that we're all singing off the same song sheet. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, I think it might have been Laura mentioned the press interest 
in all of this and the sort of negative media attention. Do you think that if this goes through um, Parliament and is passed and is implemented, do you think there will be sort of considerable interest in those decision-making procedures that happen below the sort of legislative framework? Do you think there'll be interest in how, you know, how if something goes wrong, do you think people will be interested in the recording of information, how it's shared, and where you know decisions made at a local level? Do you think that's where the focus of of, of attention would be? I mean, it's a difficult question to answer because I don't know what will happen down the line with this bill. Um, well, well we, when we mentioned the media coverage, the reason we mentioned that and the reason we flagged it to the GERFEC team was because we were worried the impact it was going to have on our members who are trying to do their job. And to do their job, they need to be trusted by the people whose doorstep they're turning up on in order to deliver care and support. So what we want to see is um, actions that kind of, whatever happens with the bill, the actions that come out that make it clear that what health visitors do is they provide care and support and they do that through building trust and meaningful relationships with the people using their services. Um, I don't know what way the media will go with this following on from here. What I do know is that we want to see the GERFEC team put forward the positive messages and underline why um, health visiting in the name person role can be meaningful. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Oliver. Uh, do you get a short supplementary? i just come in very briefly on this because I was really struck by it's part of the Unite submission um, where you, Unite the Union said they were dismayed by the approach that many in public life had taken during this debate with the name person becoming the rope in a political tug of war and that the well-being of the child and professionals identified in the name person being the potential candidates in a battle of political dogma. Ultimately, it will not be politicians who will have to argue the merits of the name person but a clinician establishing a relationship with a child and their family. And I think that's a really important point to make, is that you guys are out there at the coal face. You are you know, working with families. You have to develop a trusting relationship. And we have to be really mindful of that. OK, does anybody want to comment on that? OK, thank you very much. Uh, Gillian and then Tavish. Made exactly my point. OK, thank you. Tavish, was And the converse of that is that you expect us to pass legislation which works. And if there's a code of practice which you've all said today doesn't exist uh, because you know it's all going to change, we can't do our job. So uh, I get the point about passing sensible legislation which can work, but I'm worried about passing legislation which we don't know the basis of it because the code of practice we don't, we don't yet have. And you've confirmed that today. So what do you want us to do? Do you want us to pass legislation which, which you know has got failings in it? Or do you want us to wait and ask the government to get this right when all these other things have been sorted out? So that's a question uh, for you to answer. Uh, but it's a, but it's, a fair point, it's a fair point to be raised, but I don't really think that's what the committee is trying to do, is, is, uh, well, is uh, put forward legislation we don't know what's about. Here in that case. Right, uh, okay, Daniel? I, I asked my questions. You, you, right, okay, sorry, I thought you were coming back in. Uh, Gillian? Yeah, I think most. I'm, I'm want to ask about workload, and I think you've covered quite a lot of what I would have been asking you about anyway. But am I, am I getting it right that I think there's there's an issue here about having to evidence things that ordinarily would be very onerous to evidence could provide a bureaucracy that's going to steal time from the job that you should be doing, and I just want to ask. I mean, we've talked about the illustrative code of practice here. And the intention of putting out illustrative code of practice, I, I took that to be to engender a conversation amongst professionals as to what this code of practice could look like. I'm throwing that open to you. What would you like the code of practice to look like in terms of, and what engagement do you want to have in that process so that the code of practice does get your support as the key stakeholders? Uh, Professor Van Worden and then Annette Hall. I think the key thing is that it emphasises that parents are the expert in their own child and that others come alongside to help and support that parent in the exercise of those duties. That we want as a society to aspire to fantastic things for our kids and for another generation of children growing up, 
but we don't want to unduly pressurize parents that unless your kid is you know, right up there at the very top in it, everything, you, you're a failing parent. So it's about that, that sense of the parent being expert and the system coming along in a really supportive and encouraging way uh, to, to help maximize the, the achievement of every child. I think um, Unite would want its members to be able to have a consistency and clarity around it um, so that every practitioner across Scotland can work to the same code of practice and there's not different variations of that. There might be local tweaks, but generally that there's a consistency and a clear message and it's not based on a whole load of legal speak that we don't understand because we are health fisters and we're not lawyers. Um, well, as I said earlier, we haven't engaged on the code of practice because um, because of the fact that it's illustrative, it's going to change, and because we don't um, support the bill. Um, what, what the RCM would like to see is the Scottish Government um, giving more con careful consideration to the merits of allowing best practice in line with um, data protection law, European law, and in a manner compatible with um, the European Court of Human Rights to be the basis for information sharing provisions. And we think that um, with the right guidance and training, professionals um, can be expected and trusted um, to deliver this name person service in a way that's high quality and is consistent. We already see it with services across Scotland that they are delivered in line with standards and in accordance with best practice that's um, laid out in guidance. We don't see why that couldn't be the situation here. Okay, does anybody else have any other comments? I'd like to meet Professor McCallum. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very keen that the aspirations that we all have for children and young people um, to achieve their potential are realised. That requires that we have an infrastructure that enables information sharing um, to allow professionals to do their jobs, to deliver universal services, um, and to ensure that practitioners can work with colleagues from other disciplines in order to deliver high quality services. We have to be able to share information in order to do our jobs to the standard that the people of Scotland require us. And so any legislation has to support that and not get in the way of it. Okay, thank you very much, John. Just, and um, given that you probably have to record an awful lot of what you do on the ground already, and given that this uh, potentialist consideration might have to be evidenced in some way, is there something that you can all do to say, well, actually, we're already doing this. We already have this covered. We do not need anything bureaucratic as a layer on top of what we're already doing. Because you're, you're, you're largely doing that, particularly the Highlands have been doing this for a very long time. Does anybody want to respond to that? Yeah. Valerie. Yeah. In terms of a general dental practitioner, they obviously have their notes that they write, so they would just they would have to add a line to their notes to say, you know, I have considered this, or I've, you know, it would be, it would just be, it would, it would become a part of the, of the record keeping process. But if everything's okay and you don't think there's anything that you need to consider, do you still have to write that down? Yeah. You know. <laughs> Which is where the code of practice comes in. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joanne, you wanted to come in? Yeah, it was interesting, um, Dr McCallum's point about um, the legislation not getting in the way of your people doing their job. Um, the RCN have basically said this legislation doesn't help. Other folk have talked about the extra burden. It all feels very complicated. So is there a point where you see all of this very technical debate is getting in the road? That if somebody has to not just make a decision, but has to show evidence that they've thought about it and considered it and decided in which categories they have to consider it, um, at what point do you see this is getting in the road? What would be the test for that? Um, I, I think the um, 
where practitioners are documenting what they do in line with their professional standards so that they can have conversations with their supervisors at the moment where they're writing clinical notes um, as um, I would and as others would in order to deliver a service. Um, I don't think that the duty to consider provides much of an additional burden. I think the concern is, um, and I understand why the Code of Practice is, is written, written in the legal way it is at the moment, um, but the way it's currently written um, feels as though we would be held to evidential standards, legal evidential standards, for everything that we write, rather than um, actually we've documented the situation, the things we've discussed with, with the child and family, what we think the next steps are, and who else we need to involve. If it moves on from that to being something that has to be, um, as we would see, kind of testable in court standard, that's, that's the bit where it moves from being good practice to being an additional bureaucratic burden. But there's a duty to consider, so you do have to give evidence that you've considered it, and That's you would also have to know in what circumstances that duty applies. So there isn't any getting away from that. That is, but I'm wondering if you think that is, in your words, getting away of you doing what makes perfect sense to me is looking at a situation, uh -huh. identifying who you need to speak to about it, highlight concerns, because presumably there are circum circumstances in which the conflict mm -hmm. I mentioned in the earlier um, panel, there's a conflict between mm -hmm. the interest of the child and practice of the parent of what the parent mm -hmm. is doing. And those things are very heavily documented at the moment because they're professional, they're the sort of complex professional judgments that um, people want to talk to their professional supervisor about, they want to talk to their line manager about in order to get additional help. Mm -hmm. um, I, and my understanding is that, that you can have a code of practice that is um, for the purposes of providing additional evidence and support to um, lawyers and to government, I guess, in, in terms of how the bill is enacted. But there are, when we talk about codes of practice, we tend to say, how does this legislation turn into something we can use to help children and families? And um, currently, the code of practice is written to help lawyers, and I understand why that is. But what I think we're all saying is there can't be a division between the things that are written to help lawyers and help government enact the legislation and the things that we need to do our job. They have to be perfectly aligned. But and the, currently, they're not quite there yet. The purpose of the Code of Practice is to identify how you fulfil your mm. duty under the legislation. It isn't about, it isn't defining no, no. good practice in the sense no. of what we would normally expect. It's the obligation, and I yes. wonder if that is the thing that's going to get you in the road of good practice mm -hmm. because you're facing, it is a legal test you are facing. Professor um, I think my answer would be proportionality and it's particularly maybe important that the guidance has that. So imagine a health visitor comes in and says, oh, your kid's a wee bit slow speaking, I'm going to refer you to the speech and language therapist. Well, 95% of the time a parent would be saying, oh, wonderful, I'm just so pleased, thank you so much. The difficulty comes where the parent says, ooh, speech and language therapists, I think they're total quacks, they're a waste of time. So does that make sense? I think that the, um, there has to be proportionality. I think once you're into child protection, the, the difficulty is that there's a whole spectrum here from well-being where most parents want the well-being of the child and there's no contention at all with uh, professionals and that's the case 95% of the time. The challenge comes distinguishing what I would call is idiosyncratic parenting from poor parenting or or harmful parenting, and, and it's a sort of gradient across that and how one proportionately demonstrates in those con situations how one has considered the needs of the child, the need to communicate <coughs> with other professionals in relation to that need, and the varying extent to which that would be documented. Okay, okay thank you. Daniel, did you want to come in? Yeah, on? Just on that point, I mean, just given that it's well-being that, that, that is considered under this. And to, to your point there, I mean, the scenario um, uh, in, in disease, you know, in particular, you know, things like uh, um, uh, included uh, uh, and achieving, I mean, surely that actually brings the scope of what might be a you know, difference of opinion 
much more squarely into this, perhaps more than the 5%. You know, so, for example, one, one parent thinks that a child should be speaking up all the time, and the other person, the parent might think, you know, children should listen first and then speak. I'm not saying that would bring it, you know, in flag, but I'm just saying that it's sort of an, an example of where the... But you could see how that could lead to consequences. I'm just wondering how much of concern that is for you. I think the aspiration of Scottish Government is, you know, I'm 100% behind. You know, we want our children to do well. We want to be able to have that holistic assessment of the child and to push forward every boundary of that child's well-being. Mm -hmm. My academic challenge is that Shanari has not been through, as far as I'm aware, some test of its sensitivity and specificity, to use those technical terms. Um, and that, that then raises questions over its, differential, its capacity to differentiate uh, in such circumstances. So, for example, I'll give you a crazy example. You know, so let's say um, you've got Johnny's a seven-year-old. His dad died trying to blaze a new route up the... the uh, Mount Everest, and uh, he falls out of a tree and has a hairline fracture in his arm. A and E send a wee form to the, to the named person. Johnny fell out of a tree, and the social worker goes and speaks to, to Johnny's mum and says, you know, I think you need to be careful about Johnny claiming, etc. Mum says, Johnny's going to do what his father couldn't do and blaze this trail up Mount Everest. You've got very idiosyncratic parenting there where slightly dangerous activity is very highly valued, you know, climbing up Everest. You could stay in terms of early prevention. It's probably a latent phase. That child is probably going to do a lot of dangerous climbing in the future. You could say there's a higher risk that that child will eventually die of trying to do some mountaineering stuff. Do you have an effective intervention in that situation? And is the parenting, poor parenting, to the level that one should intervene? There are a whole bunch of complex questions in, in an example such as that. That's a very helpful hypothetical. Thank you. Although I don't think any of us have got the answer to, to that question. Thank you very much. Uh, Colin? Thank you, Vera. It, it's almost an inevitability nowadays, if you're dealing with the public, at some point there'll be a complaint. Do you think that for health organisations there should be a, a specific complaint procedure required for the named person service? Or do you think that the existing limit of the SPSO is adequate? Would anybody like to respond to that? Valerie Wright. Speak, speaking as an individual, um, I couldn't see any need to have another complaint system, but that is me speaking as, as an individual. Does the SPSO work as well as it should? in this regard, from your experience, if you have any? Uh, yep. Yeah. Again, I'm I mean, giving an, independent, uh, an, uh, an individual view, but I, I think there are, whether a complaint is of nature A or B or C, uh, as long as complaint processes can flex across all such situations, I think there are more dangers in creating an alternative mechanism than sticking to established mechanisms. Just. Moving, just to touch a little bit on consent, which I know has already been discussed. How is it best to ensure that the consent that you receive is explicit and as easy to withdraw as it is to give? Does the mechanism already exist for that? Does more work need to be done on that? What, what's your experience of it? Because I can imagine a situation where a parent might withdraw that consent. How do you deal with that? What's the process? Anyway. Sorry, do you, do you mean specifically in relation to name person? In relation to name person, but it might also reflect on your current process. As I said, I'm not a practitioner, so I'm not a clinician delivering care in that sense, but just in relation to name person, when it comes to what you've mentioned there about withdrawing consent, it's quite clear that the name person service, that the children and their family are under no obligation to engage with it if they do not want to, or if they feel they've changed their minds about it. That, that is really clear from Gerfec. They have said that. So by Gerfec's you know, guidance on this, there should be no problem if they withdraw consent and it's within the confines of named person and it hasn't crossed over into child protection. What would the mechanism be? 
because you, you've already said that your consent is not always in writing. Sometimes it's implied, sometimes it's consensual. How would you do that? Well, I imagine that's why there's a need for um, robust guidance around this, no matter what happens. If it does go forward as best practice or something happens with the bill where it gets to final stages, either way, there'll need to be robust guidance that would outline that very clearly to the practitioner. The point being, though, is that they would need to be absolutely aware that this is not an, ob an ob obligation on their part to take part in this named person service, and at any point that they want to end it, they can. That's what Gurfec the GERFEC team have said that's what they'll need to do when they bring this forward for actual implementation. Come on here. I just wanted to mention briefly, uh, Caldicott's been mentioned before, and as Alison saw, I'm a Caldicott guardian for NHS Highland, and um, this is an area of um, quite a lot of work ongoing. So Dame Fiona Caldicott produ has produced three reports over the last decade and more. And the most recent one is National Data Guardian for Health and Care, review of data security consent and opt-outs, which was produced last year by her. And it, it's considering these issues in relation to uh, health. And she just, again, doesn't provide total answers. She has a recommendation 11 that there should be new consent and opt-out models allow people to opt out of their personal confidential data being used for purposes beyond their direct care. So I'm trying to say is this is a bubbling area in relation to all of care and the new um, European legislation that is coming into play in, in that replaces the data protection. Do you think that's all still developing? Um, I think it always will be developing at one level. Uh, the technology is just changing so fast, and I think it's partly the te technological changes, you know, cloud storage of data and all these issues that are an ongoing changing scenario. I, I think it will always be a dynamic area. Thank you very much. Just a, one last question. The, the issue of guidance has come up quite a lot um, from, I think, probably everybody. And, and the, the committee had done a survey to local authorities and health uh, authorities, and s over three quarters of them agreed the same, that there should be further guidance provided by their organisation about when information could be shared. And I know that Perth and Con Ross have got a child protection committee. Has anybody got any idea of the, the best, or, or trying to take some of the best practice, or looked at the Perth and Kinross example, or other examples of how guidance is getting, has been getting rolled out? I mean, I accept that I had to stop, uh, <laughs> given, given where we are just now, but, but the, the fact that that was in place. Um, so, in, in terms of um, the existing situation, um, we looked at Perth and Kinross before we, as our data sharing partnership, yeah. developed um, guidance in this um, in this area. So we have multi-agency child protection guidance. We have guidance for um, uh, persons caring with uh, caring for for adults whose whose children are vulnerable, um, and similarly with with adults. Um, there is an overarching agreement between agencies and then there are individual agreements for the purposes of delivering particular services that we can then say to, in this situation, children and families, this is, this is how we do our business, this is what the team around the child looks like, and in the situation of withdrawing consent for a particular agency, that, that person wouldn't be part of the team around the child for that person and everybody else would just have to fill in yeah. really so in practice that's that we wouldn't see that shape see that changing and would see that the idea of the named person as being a strengthening of that and perhaps less confusion in complex situations so that so there are the possibilities of of, of organisations being able to roll out guidance once it becomes available? I, I think some organisations have the, um, have, the infra have the infrastructure in place, not all. Yeah, OK. Listen, thank you very much for that. That uh, brings us to an end of, of this session, and I want to thank you all for your evidence. That really was very helpful. Thank you. Uh, and I now formally close the public part of this meeting. Thank you.